mentioned in the first two videos, it's easy to get to a command prompt. Some people, though, don't want to be able to install terminal programs or otherwise have access to a terminal. But there's a way to use someone else's terminal, which is what we're going to get into in this video, where I show you how you can get to a command line from pretty much anywhere that's connected to the internet. So let's get on with that. Okay, and this is part three of our Getting to the Command Line series. In part one, I showed you the easy way to get to a basic default command line from Windows, Mac, and Linux. In the second video, I demonstrated better, more improved ways of getting to the command line with improved terminal programs. And in this one, I'm going to show you how to get to the command line from wherever you are in the world, as long as you have access to the internet. If you're using something like a Chromebook, where you have limited access to the stuff you can install, or something like an iPad with even more limited stuff that you can install, this will still work. Something like a Raspberry Pi, uh, your phone even. Pretty much anything that can run a terminal app can get to the Linux command line. And we're going to do this by hosting our terminal somewhere else. We're going to have a server off remotely in some other part of the world, and we're going to access it from our device. And the way I'm going to show you is using a company called DigitalOcean. There's another company out there called Linode that does essentially the same thing, but I've never used them, so I'm not going to show you that one. But once you sign up for a DigitalOcean account, it's as little as $5 a month, which sounds like a lot. But what are you paying for cloud storage anyway? What are you paying for that other computer that you're going to be installing Linux on? It's a toss-up. You can have a computer of your own for this stuff, or you can pay $5 a month to DigitalOcean to use their computer. It's a lot more reliable than doing it yourself, and maybe it's cheaper. I'm going to let you decide on that one. But let's take a look and see how this stuff works. Okay, so I've got the website here, just digitalocean.com, and it's got this blue screen, and you want to sign up for a new account. Or, just the little idea here, look at the show notes below, get my referral code, and sign up using the referral code. I'll make a couple of bucks from that, helps me out, but you don't have to. So I'm not going to go through the login. It's just basically setting up an account. You've set up accounts lots of other places, so I'll let you do that. I'm going to log in to my already existing account. They want your email and address, which I'm going to plug in right here. Of course, there's two-factor authentication, which I will check on my watch now. Two eight C five seven seven. Two factor authentication is always good if you've got it. Even more convenient if you have like an Apple Watch or something like that. Okay, so here is my home page, and I've got a domain name here that I'm going to gray out because you don't need to know that right now. But the rest of this should look pretty much the same for your your account. And what you want to use is something called a droplet. It's basically, it's a whole virtual machine where you can install things. Let's go down here to create a droplet, and I'll show you what some of those things are. Okay, so from this screen right here, what we want to do is create a droplet. There's a number of things we can do here. We can go create a Linux distribution, Ubuntu. FreeBSD, Fedora, Debian, CentOS are all just raw Linux distributions. And you can use any of them that you want. Like I said earlier, I prefer Ubuntu. Another thing that is interesting is these one-click apps over here. And these will create an entire operating system containing just the apps that you want to use. For example, if you want to set up a WordPress website, you can click on WordPress on Ubuntu 18.04, and it will create a website. It will have the web server, it will have the PHP, MySQL stack, 
pretty much everything you need that runs WordPress. It's a drag and drop WordPress server, all in one easy click. If you want a Ruby on Rails development environment, they've got that. LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, just sort of a development server for websites. They've got all kinds of neat stuff here that you can just install with one click. But that's not what we're here for. We're going to do a distribution of Ubuntu. They've got 16.04 highlighted, which is two in, almost three years old now. That's maybe the latest long-term support version that they prefer. We don't want that. We're going to go with 18.10 from October 2018. That's the newest one, at least when we're recording this. So I'm going to go with that. Next, we have to choose a size, and they highlight this $40 a month option, which is 8 gig of RAM and 5 terabytes of transfer, and that's all really nice, but way, way more than we're going to need. I'm going to go all the way down here and choose the lowest one, $5 a month, or 7 tenths of a cent per hour. And that $5 a month may sound like a lot, but you're basically paying for a whole dedicated computer that's yours and yours alone. It's pretty, che pretty cheap if you look at it like that. And this has one gig of RAM and only one CPU, 25 gig hard drive SSD space, which doesn't sound like much, but keep in mind we're going to be dealing with text-based apps. 25 gigabytes is just an insane amount of space for that stuff. We'll be fine. It'll be good. And a one terabyte of transfer back and forth through the internet. So I'll click on that one and go with that. We don't care about these special optimized things. Backups. Uh, backups are an option for a dollar a month. That's cheap enough if you want to go with it. But it's all text files. It's all small. It's easy enough to do backups other ways. So I'm not going to bother. Your data center region. Choose the one that's closest to you. If you're in Germany, choose Frankfurt. If you're in Singapore, choose Singapore. In the United States, you've got a choice of either San Francisco or New York. And New York is already highlighted for me, and that'd be what I'd want, because I'm closer to New York than San Francisco. Additional options? Nope. SSH keys is a security method of logging in without knowing passwords. It's more than I want to get into in this video, but we will cover it another time. For now, though, no. How many droplets do you want? Just one. Choose a host name. And it's got this long, complicated thing here. I'm going to change that to going text. Why might that be, you ask? Okay, so going text is the name of it. Click on create. And it's doing its thing up here with this little slider. I'm not going to time I'm not going to time lapse this or speed it up or anything. It's pretty quick. It's going to do its thing in about a minute or so. You can watch it. It's already half done. Basically what it's doing is formatting a drive, it's installing Linux, and it's setting up IP numbers and networking and stuff, and boom, it's done. Okay, so the only thing here that we have to really know right off the bat is this IP number. That's how you access it. And it's always a good idea to literally write this down. So I'm going to do that. 157.230.8.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
the number that we just wrote down from the website or from the email and here we are gives us a security message don't worry about it basically we've never connected it in the, with this machine before so it doesn't recognize it but we did it right we're okay so we type in yes Y isn't good enough you got to type in Y E S and it asks for that password which hopefully it is in my clipboard paste it in there boom and we get all kinds of stuff we are in and you can take the time to read all this when you get a chance but basically down here it says we have to change the password because that long string isn't going to work first thing at once is the current password one more time I will paste it again enter the new Unix password um, something like one two three four is too short so let's go with something fancy. Brian, one, two, three, four. Brian, one, two, three, four. And we're in. Now we can do anything we want. We can look at our directory, and there's not much there. Um, well, we'll do more another time. First thing we want to do, though, is update, <clears throat> is update all the repositories and stuff so we can when we do go to update things and install things, they'll be the current packages. So to update the repository list, we type sudo apt get update. And it'll look at things out on the internet and update all our packages. Boom. And now it's now it knows where to go for all the updates. Now we'll actually tell it to update. Uh, sudo apt get upgrade update updates the list of stuff upgrade actually does the work and there's a list of things in here all these little packages that need to be updated yes and this will take a few minutes taking longer than I expected for the first time, but it is the first time, so it's got a lot to upgrade. Again, unless you're seeing a bunch of error messages, you don't really care what all this stuff is saying for the most part. As long as it works, we don't need to know all that. This takes too much longer. I will time lapse it. And there we're done. We can type clear to get a nice new clean screen. And now the system is installed and it's all set up. And the only thing left to do is add a regular user. There's a couple different levels of users in Linux. You got the root user who installed everything and has controlled every single file in the system and that's great if you really really know what you're doing and never make a mistake but it's kind of dangerous because you can delete things by accident you could kill your sit if you've ever deleted something really important in Windows or deleted you know a system file that's bad you don't want to be able to do that so most of the time you log in you want to do it under a user account instead of the root account so we're gonna make a user account and we do that by add user and then the username and it does it it's going to ask for some new questions ask for a new password for the user we did one a little while ago for the root but now we're going to do it for the user and password updated successfully Changing user information for Brian, enter the new full value, or press enter for default. Full name. Room number, 
If it's a classroom or something, I don't have a room number, so I'm going to leave that. Work phone, don't care. Home phone, don't care. Other, nope. Is this correct? Yes. Now, what we, all we really need is the name. And now we have a user. Now, the, I said there was a root user that could do everything. And a regular user can't do so much. They're kind of limited. They can't even install software. If you remember a minute ago when I did the update and upgrade, I had to use that sudo command. That makes you sort of a user level up. It takes your user and makes you higher than that, a super, a super user. And Brian, the user I just made on here, is not a super user. He couldn't do that. So in order to be able to do things like updates, I can set it up as a super user. User mod minus little case a capital G pseudo Brian. What this will do is it will change that Brian account. So if I want to do super user things, I can just type that sudo command. And now that's done that. Okay, so now we're going to uh, exit. And we're off. Okay, so now I'm going to exit and just close out of everything just to make it real clear what's going on. Now I'm going to get logged back in using that user account. SSH Brian at 157.230.8400. Two thirty-eight, and it should do the same thing. And now I want to put in my password, and we're in. And we've got some very basic little uh, configuration files in there. Some very simple apps and things like that. We'll do more starting in the next video. But at this point, if you don't already have a Linux command line installed in some way in your system using the Windows system for subsystem for Linux, an actual Linux system, the Mac system, if you can't get to a command line some other way, this will do that. Using an app like Termius or Blink on the iPad, Secure Shell for Chrome OS, and there are other ways for other devices. But anything you can do that will let you SSH to another machine can take advantage of this. And that's all we're going to talk about today. We've got it all set up. In the next video, we'll look at configuring it and getting some useful stuff done. Finally, if you can't wait, and I know you don't like to wait, pick up the book, Going Text, Living on the Command Line, by me, wherever books are sold. Otherwise... I'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.